This is the second part of the DNA topology lectures. And I guess we're starting 10 minutes late, so I'll try not to go way over time, but uh, I, I will need the full hour uh, because I, I want to walk you through the process of looking at a biological question, doing the mathematical modeling, and I want to at least give you an idea of what the mathematical tools involved are. There's no time to go through any of the proofs, but I have the proofs in my slides, and they will be posted, some of the proofs, so that you get a flavor for what the techniques are in, in this field. Um, and then the next lecture will, for the next lecture, we'll change gears and talk about random knotting and uh, packing of DNA. Okay, so let me, I'll pick it up more or less from where I left yesterday, but I will repeat a few things so that we have a complete story in uh, today's hour. So we talked about DNA yesterday. So remember that by virtue of DNA being a right-handed double helix, when the helix is unzipped for DNA replication, these red arrows right here, well, I don't know if you see that they're red, but the, the small arrows in the center represent the polymerases, the enzymes that are copying the strands of DNA. So this would be the parental DNA molecule, the DNA that is going to be copied. The word for copying DNA is called replication. And this is called the replication fork. So the hydrogen bonds are broken. Polymerases make an identical copy of each one of the single strands. But because this is a double helix and that's not depicted in this picture, there will be an accumulation of positive crossings, positive supercoils ahead of the replication fork. Some of those positive crossings will diffuse behind the replication fork. And if we start with a circular DNA molecule, like for example, the chromosome of a bacterium, in the case of a bacteria like E. coli, the chromosome has one origin of replication, that's the dark dot right there and replication proceeds bidirectionally. So here you have one replication fork, here you have another one, and they're moving from left to right toward the blue arrow. The blue arrow is called the diff site and is very close to the terminus of replication. So this fork is moving on the top from left to right, and this one is moving on the bottom from left to right. Both of them are causing this accumulation of positive supercoils ahead of the replication fork and precatenase behind the replication fork. And uh, so at the end of replication, if the enzymes are that are in charge of relaxing the DNA were not able to complete their job, at the end of replication, these precatenanes become links. They become topological links, and it has been shown experimentally that all of these links are of the type T2,2N. So they're torus links, and they look like this. So you could have the I mean, the ideal outcome is two circles that are independent, so an on-link. But you may have links with two crossings, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, etc. Very complicated links. So that's the product of replication. Now, this cell wants to divide into two cells, and each cell wants to, needs to inherit one copy of the chromosome. So something has to happen that will unlink these two DNA molecules. And what happens is that enzymes are in charge of doing the unlinking. It is widely accepted that in E. coli, the type 2 topoisomerase, topo 4, unlinks the DNA. And for topologies, what topo 4 does is it does a crossing change. Just changes a positive crossing with a negative crossing. Or, or negative to positive. I mean, the orientation might or might not be important, but that's topic for a different talk. And these topoisomerases will act very quickly, very efficiently on the interlinked DNA and will unlink the two newly replicated circles, which then can segregate to the daughter cells at cell division. Okay, now there, there's pills here because these enzymes, the type 2 topoisomerases, appear everywhere. Every organism that has been studied has type 2 topoisomerases. Not only they're everywhere, but they're essential to life. If the type 2 topoisomerases stop working, the cell dies. So that makes them really good targets for drug design. And uh, so in particular, if you have a bacterial infection, 
some antibiotics will target the type 2 topoisomerases in the bacterium that is making you sick. So some of you may have uh, taken ciprofloxacin for urinary tract infection or ear infection. That inhibits the action of this enzyme. DNA gets terribly tangled. The cells die. You get better. That's the, the gist of it. There is anti-cancer drugs that also target uh, type 2 topoisomerases. It's not so easy in that case because the, the, uh, the antibiotic that targets the type 2 topoisomerase of the bacterium is not doing anything to your own topoisomerase. But the one that targets the type 2 topoisomerase in the cancer is also targeting the topoisomerase it's on in all your other cells. So the side effects, as we all know, for chemotherapy can be very nasty. And uh, But there's a, 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 a good set of... Um, of um, anti-cancer drugs and um, a colleague of ours, Lynn Sidrich, in a talk I listened a few months ago said that all anti-cancer drugs tailored for children are type 2 topoisomerase inhibitors. So very widely used. So they're very important drugs. Now what happens if you use this drug and it doesn't work? Is it because the drug is not going into the cell? That's a possibility. So somehow the cells change, the bacteria mutated, and, and they're not allowing the drug in. Or is it that the drug is going in, it's doing its job, it's inhibiting the topoisomerase, and yet the cells still survive? If that's true, then how are they surviving? Who is untangling? Who is decatenating or unlinking the DNA? So there must be other processes that could rescue the cell from imminent death when the topoisomerase doesn't work. So that's the focus of what I'm going to talk about today, not on the application, not on the clinical application side, but on the basic science understanding the mechanism of these enzymes. And uh, so my collaborator, David Sheratin, at the University of Oxford a few years ago, and actually that, that effort started in 2003, they, they had some reason in their experiments to inhibit the topoisomerase. And uh, they saw that the topoisomerase, when, when it was inhibited, still uh, they were able to unlink the replication links with another type of enzymes, XCRC and D, which are site-specific recombination enzymes that this particular lab has been working on for decades, since the early 80s. I mean, it might even be the lab that first presented the main action of that enzyme, XCRCD. It's a, it's a mouthful, but XCRCD are two enzymes that bind to the DNA. They bind specifically to a sequence of DNA that's called the diff site. It's uh, about 28 base pairs long. And in vivo, in the cell, they act in conjunction with another enzyme called FTSK that is a powerful translocase. It pulls DNA very quickly. So if these two enzymes act together, um, this lab showed that they can untie the range of replication links. They can untie, unlink torus links of this form. They're right-handed, and the diff sites are what we call in parallel orientation. So, so the crossings are all positive, so right-handed with positive crossings. That's what, what it means mathematically. Okay, so we want to understand the action of these enzymes. These enzymes can do the job. They do it slowly, much slower than the topoisomerase, but they can do the job. How are they doing that? And the action is not by crossing change. The action is by strand passage. I mean, sorry, the action is by reconnection, by site-specific recombination. It's a reconnection event, like uh, I mentioned yesterday, and uh, that has an analogy in, in a reconnection of fluid flows and... and um, so everything that I'm going to say here, if you want to think in reconnection in physics, you can just do that and not think about the DNA uh, because everything should apply equally. Of course, the conclusions here are biological. So here we have the range of replication links and some reaction that takes them to the unlink. And of course, you have you never have a very clean product. You have a distribution of topologies as a product you have DNA knots or links, and I, I have a copy of the experiments and the gels if anyone is interested in that, but I, I don't have time to present them so that you can see what the experimental data look like. 
I can show you after the talk. Uh, so you have a distribution of nodes and links, and most of them are on links. So remember from what we said yesterday, by local reconnection, well, you underst we understand the local action of the recombinase. Cut, recombine, paste, very easy, right? The local reconnection, very simple. But that's not enough to understand the global topological changes. So just remember that product topology is a direct consequence of the geometrical conformation adopted by the substrate. Substrate is what you started with prior to recombination. So the way the embedding, so the embedding matters before reconnection and will have a direct impact on the topology of the product. Okay, so here are the two big questions. The first question is, if I start with a torus link, in this case a six crossing torus link, but two n crossing torus link, I know that this crossing link goes to the on link. What are all the pathways to get there? And in particular, we always assume that nature does things as efficiently as possible. So what are the shortest pathways to get from a six crossing torus link or a two n crossing torus link to the on link? How many steps are needed? And it's a right-handed torus link with parallel sides like this, with positive crossings. If you have, just I want you to think about this, if you, if you flipped one of these arrows, so let's flip this green arrow to point from right to left, then you can do the reconnection right there. Right there, you could go from here to there, and what would you get? you would get the on knot right away in one step, right? Well, that's not what these enzymes are doing. Well, it, they're doing this, but it doesn't work that way because the orientation is the wrong orientation. So in our case, you cannot go to the on knot in one step. You need more than one step. Okay, so let's see what that is. And, and then once we have the many steps needed to get to the on knot and to the on link, then can we just zoom into each one of the steps and explain how the machine is working, how the enzyme is doing its work, what is the mechanism? And uh, when we talk to biologists about mechanism, they're thinking biochemistry, they're thinking going down to looking at the atoms and how the amino acids interact, and they're really, really thinking about the biochemistry. So talking to biologists throughout the years, I have, uh, become accustomed to not say mechanism, but say topological mechanism. Because the moment you say topological mechanism, then things are looked at from outside. Yeah, so it's a lower level resolution, and uh, the biochemistry still remains the same, but uh, we're interested in these large range effects. So again, if we have this torus link, first step, so you're going many steps to the on link, well, first step, you go to some knot. You maybe you know what the knot is, maybe you don't. But let's, let's assume you, you know the crossing number for this knot. And then you have some reaction. The enzymes bind the DNA. This blue ball represents the enzymes, and we want to know what is happening inside the blue ball. We w that's what we mean by topological mechanism. What is the embedding? inside the blue ball, what is the tangle right there? And we, we talked about tangles last time, and I'll uh, mention tangles again. Okay, so, so let's rewind. What is, so these enzymes are site-specific recombinases. Site-specific recombinases are enzymes that bind two pieces of DNA that are identical at the sequence level. And these sequences are fairly short. R usually they range between five and 50 base pairs long. 5 and 50 base pairs long is corresponds, if you're thinking in physics terms, to a very stiff piece of rod. You need 300 base pairs to go and come back. That's the Kuhn length of DNA. Go and come back, have something completely flexible. You need 300 base pairs. So if you are in the range of 30 base pairs, this is a very stiff. It's like taking uh, this extension cord. There it looks flexible. If I just pick this piece of the extension cord, I can't really do much with it, okay? So that's important to remember when we're doing the modeling. And, um, okay, well, 
changes mediated by these enzymes can have important phenotypic effects. That means that they, they, there's enzymes like this all over in the cell, in every organism, and they're doing different things. They're integrating uh, viral DNA into the host DNA. They're moving DNA. Yesterday I told you about Barbara McClintock and jumping genes. Well, these enzymes are the ones that are in charge of moving one gene from one part of the of the genome to another part of the genome. So there, there's a very wide range of uh, site-specific recombination enzymes. Okay, um, and locally, we will talk about the recombination reaction as a local reconnection reaction. If the sites are pointing in opposite directions, now what is the orientation of the sites? The site is, a, in my case, a 30 base pair long word that word is a word on A, T, C, and G, the nucleotides, and typically that word is not a palindrome. So once you see the word, you assign an orientation to it arbitrarily, and then you keep traveling along the curve, and when you find the other specific site, so you have, say, one circle with two sites, so you find a word, you assign an orientation, and then the other word is here. Well, if this word reads from here to there, then that's the arrow, and this is called direct repeats. And if the second word is in opposite orientation, then that's called inverted repeats. Okay. Now, when the two sides come together for the recombination reaction, in the diagram, they can appear to be in parallel orientation or in anti-parallel orientation. Locally, because we understand the biochemistry of these enzymes, and these cartoons give you a hint to what the biochemistry is, um, in this case, you will expect a plus crossing or a negative crossing to appear in the domain. So you go from what we call a zero tangle to a plus or minus one tangle, so there it should be plus or minus one, and if the arrows are pointing in the opposite direction, you go from the zero tangle to the infinity tangle, so the, the transaction that I had drawn here. And I'll leave this up here for reference. Okay. Okay, so mathematical model, just a reminder, we model DNA as a curve properly embedded in three-dimensional space. If, uh, and that curve is the axis of the helix. If the DNA molecule is circular, then you have a proper embedding of a circle in three-dimensional space. So DNA knots are modeled as mathematical knots and or unions of knots, therefore links. And site-specific recombination will be modeled as a two-step reaction in the experiment that we are interested in today. The substrate is a torus link of the type T22N. Here, the substrate is a non-knot, so the topology may, may change here, and but that's a substrate. It goes into the black box. That's the enzyme doing its job, and it outputs a product or a range of products. So here is one example where you start with a non-knot, and you end up with a four-crossing torus link. This is one example that we covered in the tutorial yesterday, but uh, it's just an illustration. If you try to look uh, under the microscope to figure out what that black box looks like, this is what it looks like, and that's what, it what inspired the Tangle method uh, that was uh, developed by the Witt Sumners and his then student, Klaus Ernst, uh, who is now a professor at the University of Western Kentucky in Bowling Green. And uh, so they, they developed this method in the 1990s. And again, I use the word method. So in the mathematical community uses the word model. But for biologists, model is something that is maybe right, maybe wrong. So it's just a model, right? They, they, they come up with experiments and they propose a model that needs to be verified. So talking to them, they said, why do you call it model? This is a method. I mean, this is a mathematical method. It's, it provides you tools to solve a problem. So you should call it method. And I, I agree with them, so I call it method. <laughs> but uh, usually in math community, people call it model. Of course, a method involves modeling. 
of this enzymatic reaction. So they're both fine. And uh, here, if we look under the microscope, we see that dark spot, and that dark spot is the enzymatic complex. So everything that we can gather from here is that the enzyme, if we, if we know, and they knew in this experiment, that their substrate was a single circle, and they can see in the picture that there's two arcs coming out. Well, a single circle with two arcs coming out, there must be two arcs inside. So that's all you know. Okay, so that complex will be modeled as a topological ball in three dimensions, and it has two pro properly embedded arcs inside. The arcs uh, do not self-intersect and do not intersect each other, so everything is nice. So they model that as a three ball with two arcs, therefore a two-string tangle. And um, in the tangle method, the two-string tangle is equipped with a homeomorphism of pairs that determines the framing that pins the four endpoints of the arcs to four equatorial preferred points, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and tangles are studied by their tangle diagrams, just like knots. Okay, so there's three different tangle families, the rational tangles, the locally knotted tangles, and the prime tangles. These families are disjoint. Uh, locally knotted tangles are tangles where you can find a local knot in any of the strands. It means you can find a two-sphere that intersects the arc in exactly two points and traps a knotted arc. That's a locally knotted tangle. A rational tangle is a tangle that is homeomorphic to this one with a homeomorphism of pairs that takes the ball to a ball and the two arcs to another two arcs, but it's allowed to move the boundary, so it may do something like that. And that's the Rubik's Cube uh, analogy that I gave you yesterday. And prime tangles are all the rest. Most of the tangles will be prime tangles. And in some, I mean, some knot theorists consider these as being just trivial tangles. All rational tangles have been trivial tangles because they're homeomorphic to this one. In our case, we are interested in trapping that geometry and, and uh, that particular embedding. So if we, if we have, I mean, of course, if we close the tangle like this, this is a non-knot. This remains a non-knot. For us, the beauty of the tangle is that it allows me to pin down these two crossings and to remember them. Whereas if I remove the tangle, these two objects are topologically exactly the same. Okay, so most tangles in biology are in the class of rational tangles, although we, we have found uh, prime tangle solutions. Do they actually occur in nature? It's, it's not clear. A uh, class of them, um, the class of Montesinos tangles, do occur in, in nature. But uh, beyond that, it's not very clear. But uh, most of them are rational tangles. And the rational for that, if uh, you see a picture, and again, I can show you a picture, but after the talk, <laughs> of um, there is X-ray crystallographical work of proteins with DNA attached to them. Usually, the, s the DNA sits neatly around the protein. So this can be thought as a ball with strings wrapping around the boundary of the ball. And that's exactly what you can do with a rational tangle, because you can imagine here that this blue, this blue arc spans a disk with an arc to, to the boundary, same on this side. The moment you tie the rational tangle, you can pull those arcs on the boundary with you, with those disks, and the rational tangle can be very, the, the the arcs can be, be very neatly pushed to the boundary. And that's exactly what the DNA looks like when bound by proteins. So, so that's uh, the rational underlying this uh, claim. There is a classification theorem for rational tangles. So we saw this yesterday, but just remember that you can associate a rational number uniquely to each rational tangle except for this one that gets the infinity number. And you can, from the rational number, via a continued fraction calculation, under certain rules, you can associate what we call the Conway vector, so a classifying vector 
that tells you a recipe to tie this tango. Was there a question? No. Okay. Okay. I didn't have this in my slides yesterday, but the proof for the classification theorem here uses going to the covering spaces and it uses a proof for the classification of rational knots, which relies heavily on the proof for classification of length spaces. I recommend that you look at the proof by Goldman and Kaufman from 1997 and then Kaufman and Lambropoulos uh, have other proofs in 2004 that are combinatorial in nature. They don't require going to the covering spaces. They're very beautiful, very constructive. And in particular, if you decide to study this and give it to an undergraduate class, this is the way to go. And I've done that, and students can, can manage it. I mean, it's, well, one of the sides of the proof is difficult for students, but the other one is very constructive and, and is very amenable for, for teaching. Uh, whereas these proof would require much more work, maybe a full semester or a full quarter of uh, giving them the background. Anyway, so now, okay, so we have rational tangles. They're relevant in biology. How do we get from here to the knots and the links that appear in biology? We use two tangle operations. Well, or yeah, two tangle operations, the sum of two tangles, which basically glues the northeast endpoint in A to the northwest endpoint in B, southeast in A to southwest in B, and makes a new tangle. Now, this is not a well defined operation. Imagine if you add the two infinity tangles, that one on the board right there. Then after addition, you get a floating circle in the center. You don't get a two-string tangle anymore. But still, these are very helpful, useful operations for us. Um, and they have good properties. And then we use a numerator operation. The numerator of A plus B is obtained by gluing northwest of A to northeast of B, southwest of A to, north to southeast of B. And the numerator of A or the numerator of the sum of A plus B is a knot or link with two components. And if A and B are rational <coughs> tangles, then the numerator of A plus B is a four plat or two bridge knot. These knots have been classified. They're also called rational knots. So we can also associate to each two bridge knot a vector, an integer entry vector that tells you how to tie it. And we can associate two rational numbers that classify it. So this, this what, what this should mean to you is we have these knots in biology and these tangles in biology, they're topological objects, but the ones that appear in biology are related to rational tangles and rational knots and can be represented by integer entry vectors and by rational numbers. And that will lead us to be able to do tangle calculus and solve systems of equations where the unknowns are tangles, where the unknowns are topological objects. Okay, so tangle method assumptions. The enzyme will be modeled as a tangle. E, that's the blue tangle. It consists of the enzyme, which is a three-dimensional ball, and the bound DNA. And this enzyme plus bound DNA turns into the substrate or the product by the numerator operation. Okay, so what you start with, the, the, uh, the substrate after the enzyme has bound to it, is represented as the numerator of a tangle. Now we're going to look inside this tangle. We're going to take this tangle and assume, so this is one of the bigger assumptions in the tangle method. We will assume that this tangle can be seen as the sum of O plus P. So what this means is we're taking the tangle E, that's that ball right there, E, and we are partitioning that ball into two, into two tangles, into the sum of two tangles. Um, this is um, represented for clarity, but in reality, physically, you need to imagine P to be really, really, really tiny. You imagine P to be a tangle that contains a very short piece of DNA, okay? That piece of DNA where the cleavage will take place. And O contains everything else that is interesting, topologically and geometrically interesting outside the tangle P. And then the next big assumption is that P is replaced with R. So 
Site-specific recombination is modeled as tangal surgery, where, so this is where the cleavage takes place, recombination. P is replaced with R, P is called the parental tangle, R is called the recombinant tangle, O is called the outside tangle. And we can make assumptions that are based on the biology on P and R, so that P and R are very simple, just like those shown in the picture. And then everything that is left is to really understand the tangle O to understand the mechanism of the enzyme. Everyone with me? Yeah, good. Okay, so the biological assumptions here is the tangle P. I'm going to make P so tiny that it only contains the recombination site. In this case, it's a 28 base pair site for XCRC and E. For other enzymes, it will be something al around that range as well, or maybe even shorter if you just want to focus on the place where strictly the DNA is being cut. So it contains the core regions of the recombination sites. And then, because we understand the biochemistry and we understand these enzymes from a biological perspective really well, we know that if P is zero and the two arrows are pointing in opposite directions, I don't know if you can see that, but this one is going from left to right and from right to left, then recombination goes through the two steps and yields the infinity tangle. This is called the zero tangle. This is called the infinity tangle. They're trivial tangles. And if R, uh, sorry, if P is parallel, so if the arrows are both pointing in the same direction in the alignment when they come together, then R will be plus or minus one for most enzymes that look like XCR. For other enzymes, there might be an iterative process where you go from the zero to plus one with a rotation and then another rotation and then another rotation. So we tend to say R will be an integral tangle, so a horizontal row of twists. Okay? But for XCR recombination, we can assume that it's plus one or minus one based on the biology. And the other thing I want to say, because this always leads to confu confusion, the parallel and parallel versus anti-parallel orientation, this really is at the diagram level with the alignment of the sites. But mathematically, for these to be well-defined, parallel versus anti-parallel, you would need the sites to be strictly coplanar. Then, if you have two sites that are strictly coplanar, then if they appear in anti-parallel orientation, there's no option to see them in parallel orientation. However, strict coplanarity does not exist in nature. So, the sites will not be strictly coplanar, and you will always be able to find a projection where you see anti-parallel, and then another projection where you see parallel alignment. So this is always a source of confusion, so I, I, I want to emphasize this is not the same as what I was uh, defining here. This is well defined. Either the two sides induce the same orientation into the circle, or they induce opposite orientations. This is when the two sides come together. They may come together as anti-parallel, or they may come together as parallel, in the diagram, but you can always choose another projection where you go from parallel to anti-parallel. And this is the, pic the biological picture of the enzymes that we work with, and these are the angles measured by the crystallographers, which basically indicates if you have the front view, which is this one, and the side view, which is this one, in one you see them anti-parallel, and the other one you see them parallel. So this is uh, consistent. Okay. Um, I will uh, skip through this. I mean, this basically says when the si just what I just told you. So since the sites are not going to be coplanar, then depending on the orientation, you will see zero with parallel, zero anti-parallel, and if you change the orientation, you will also see a plus or minus one or an infinity, depending on how you're looking at this in three-dimensional space. Okay, so recombination will be modeled as a band surgery, and when did I start? <laughs> Sorry, I lost, uh, yeah. So I have about 20 minutes, right? Yeah, okay, so if L is a link in S3, a band is an embedding of a rectangle into S3, such that the inverse image of the L, of the, of the link under this map B is I cross the boundary of I. So basically, what this is telling you, and here I have the illustration for a twisted band, 
but what this is telling you is that if this is part of your link, and this is part of your link, you consider a band here and an operation that will turn that into this. Okay, but of course this band could be embedded in some interesting ways in three-dimensional space. Okay, so if site-specific recombination at sites in direct repeats, those are these ones, and the recombination reaction that we're studying for the replication links corresponds to two sites in direct repeats. If we orient the substrate and product using the orientation of the recombination sites, so the band surgery corresponding to one recombination event is coherent, and here we have the definition a band surgery is called coherent if the orientations of L and L sub B agree except that the band. Okay, so what I want you to retain from this, where is uh, Oh, it's wet, right? Okay, maybe let me try just to draw it here and so that I don't take too much time. So what I want you to retain from this is that if you have two sides that induce the same orientation into the circle in the substrate, the product might be a two-component link And the components inherit the orientation, so each component will have one recombination site, and the components inherit the orientation of the recombination site. And we model this operation with a band surgery, and we just carry that orientation with us. Okay, so let's talk. Now that we have set up the model, and it's well, I guess a quite straightforward model, although it has a lot of different components. We can go back to the initial questions. Let's talk about pathways and let's talk about mechanism. Let's first talk about pathways. If I start with a two-end crossing torus link with two sides in parallel orientation, and we get to the on-link, how many steps do I need to get there? What is the minimum number of steps that I need to get there? And uh, this has been in collaboration with uh, Koya Shimokawa, Kai Ishihara, and the biologists, uh, Grain, uh, Ian Grange and, and David Sherratt. I showed their pictures last time. The first result we have says, if we assume that the action of the enzyme is modeled as a system of tangle equations, N of O plus P is a substrate, and N of O plus R is a product, where we assume that P is simple, P is zero, and R is infinity minus one or plus one, like I showed here, then we can show that at least two M recombination events are needed to convert this link to the on link. So if you start with a six crossing torus link, you need at least six steps to get to the on link. This is one example of a pathway. Once you have this claim and you have one example of a pathway, you can ask, are there any other pathways? To ask the question whether there are any other pathways, we needed to make some assumptions. So we went back to the biology, looked at the experimental data, and in the experimental data, they incubated their enzyme with these links, and over time, they did a time course experiment. Over time, they saw a majority of onlinks, and throughout the experiments, the time course, they saw intermediate knots and links. So what this is implying or suggesting is that the complexity of the products, complexity as measured by minimal crossing number, goes strictly down at every step on of the unlinking reaction. So this is a quite strong assumption and is suggested by the experiments. It's not confirmed by the experiments. So we'll get back to getting rid of the assumption later. But let's see what we can do with a strong assumption. Complexity goes strictly down. If I start with a 2n crossing link, the next step has to take me to 2n minus 1 or lower. Okay? And that's for every step. Okay, so under this assumption, we can prove that if the substrate is a 2n 2n 
crossing link, and this is written uh, with six, as in the picture, with parallel sides, and the product is our a knot or link with two m minus one or fewer crossings, then the only possible product is a two m minus one torus knot. In the picture, the example for six crossing torus link going to five one knot. But this applies to any number of crossings. So if you apply this iteratively, you can show that, well, the six crossing torus link has to go to a five one knot, then the five one knot has to go to the four crossing torus link. The four crossing torus link has to go to the three crossing torus knot, which is a trefoil. That one has to go to the hop link. That one has to go to the on knot, and then finally to the on link. What this is telling me is that the minimal pathway that I showed before is the only way to get there. So the, shor the shortest on linking pathway is unique, and it follows this pattern under that assumption. Any questions up to here? No? OK. OK, well, this just repeats it for the six crossing case, so that it's more concrete. You see the, five the six steps right here explicitly. You go from, not, uh, from link to not to link to not to link to not, etc. Now let's talk about topological mechanism. So now I have a pathway. So now the question is, in each step of the pathway, what is the mechanism? And since this is the same enzyme, one, in general, biologists assume that the mechanism doesn't change from one step to the next. But that's a big question. So what is the mechanism? And if we can prove mathematically that the mechanism is unique, that's a really great thing. We cannot always prove that. But, but if we can, that's a great thing. So topological mechanism. Here we go back to the tangle equations, and I'll tell you more about tangle equations now. So uh, remember, you have your substrate that are the replication links. They go into the black box, but the black box now has a mathematical structure. And you end up with products that are DNA knots and links with a lot of onlinks. You are going to focus on only one step of that reaction, so you're going to model Going back to the modeling of the of the tangle method, you're going to model your enzyme as this tangle E, and the substrate and the product will be the numerator of E, where E is broken into O plus P. So numerator of O plus P for the substrate, numerator of O plus R for the product. And sometimes we break O further into two pieces, OF and OB, and this is actually relevant for the case that we're working on now. OB will be that gray part in the, in the enzyme tangle, the gray part that you don't see. And OF is an outside free tangle. Those, are, those would be crossings that remain on the outside. So you can think that you could have a scenario like this, where you have this knot to start with, the enzyme binds to the recombination sites in that zero tangle. The gray uh, enzyme ball that I showed before traps two crossings, and then these two, three, four, five crossings are actually left outside. That's a possible scenario. Now, mathematically, it doesn't matter to us if one is outside and the other one is inside. We just consider O to be the sum of OF plus OB, and all of those are outside P. So we just distinguish between P and the exterior of P. So the, the bounding ball for P is partitioning the three sphere into, uh, in the bounding sphere for P is partitioning the three sphere into two three balls. The three ball that defines the tangle P and the exterior that will be in effect the ball for O. Okay, so the numerator of the sum of these tangles is going to be a two bridge knot or a, or a four plot. Here is the illustration on how to uh, how to describe the four plot with a integer entry vector and using braid notation. And the aim is if you have a tangle P that you know and a, and a four plot knot or link K that you know, can you find tangle solutions O equals OF plus OB to tangle equations of this form? Can we solve those equations? So now, for if we go back to the biological question, each step 
in this two-step reaction will be modeled by an equation, a tangle equation. Numerator of O plus P is K0, numerator of O plus R is K1. You possibly know K0, you usually know K0. You may not know K1, but you'll have some information about K1. Either it's crossing number or, I mean, you, you will have some information. Sometimes you know it perfectly. Okay, so question, can we solve for O? So in this case, in the system case, we know K0, we know K1, we have already made assumptions on P and R, so we know P, we more or less know R, so it could be a plus one or a minus one, but there's, there isn't that much leeway in there. Or if, they could be, if, the, if the alignment is this one, it could be the infinity tangle. So the big question mark is, can we solve for O? And this is at the core of everything that we do in the tangle method. Can we solve for O? And uh, if we assume that O is a rational tangle, or the sum of two rational tangles, then we can solve for O using the tangle calculus that Ernst and Sommers, Sumner's developed. Uh, it first came out in this paper in 1990 in the uh, uh, Math Proceedings of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. There they have two more papers in 1999. Uh, no, they have one more paper in 1999, and Ernst has two papers, I think 96 and 97, furthering the techniques and the tools for tangle calculus. So here is a different notation, but you have a rational tangle, x over y, another rational tangle, u over b. The numerator of a plus b will be k, where k is a four-plot, defined, and it does a notation for four-plots, where p and q are the I mean their, their numerator and denominator of the classifying rational number for the four plot. And these are the classifying rational numbers for the rational tangles. What this lemma tells us from their paper is that you can relate these numbers P, Y, U, X, and V with a very, very simple algebraic equation, very simple. And this equation really is the one that leads us to solve the system of equations. Then there's other things that we learn from this lemma and that we get to use when the solutions are complicated. But this first step is often everything that we need to solve the equations. Okay, so what this means is that the system of tangle equations, if the tangles are rational or sum of rational tangles, can be solved. Solving them is a tedious endeavor, but it's easy because you saw the equation. It's not a difficult equation. So what we did is we did an implementation. Is this is a, a, a Java application that basically solves the tangle equations for you, assuming that substrate and product are, um, are rational tangle. Uh, sorry, assuming that the the tangles involved are that the tangle O is rational or the sum of two rational tangles. And uh, we also wanted this application to be used by biologists who do experiments and who have no interest in learning about tangles or four plots or anything like that. So, so for them, they can just double click on the picture that matches their experiment and say, this is my substrate, this is my product, find me the solutions, and the solutions are shown in pictorial form. Notplot also has a tangle calculator. They kind of, they overlap in some senses, they supplement e each other in some other senses. In our case, we can model iterative, uh, like processive recombination, which Notplot can't, and Notplot can all do other things that we can't. Okay, so that's there as a tool for learning about tangles and for other people. So now I said if we assume that the tangle is rational or sum of rational, then we can solve it. Well, how do we prove whether the tangles involved are rational or sum of rationals? So recombination, as I said before, is modeled by tangle surgery where P is replaced with R. If the tangle has uh, is rational or sum of rational tangles, then this can be solved with tangle calculus. And rationality of those tangles is detected by going up to the double branch cyclic covering spaces. If numerator of O plus P is a substrate knot, imagine an on knot, and P is a rational tangle, then we know that rational tangles will lift to a solid torus. So here you have a solid torus. The core of the solid torus is a knot in the covering space. And I mean, it might be a trivial knot, 
or it might not be a trivial knot, if the core, I mean, if, if P is rational and the, the substrate is the unknot, P lifts to a solid torus, O lifts to something that, ha that is bounded by a two-dimensional torus, and the unknot lifts to S3. So when we go from P to R, we are in effect doing dense surgery on the complement of that knot, K knot. So understanding tangle surgery is equivalent to understanding dense surgery at the covering space level. So this is where the low dimensional topology comes in to these proofs. So challenges, if you have unknotted substrates, can we characterize lens spaces which can be obtained by dense surgery on the exterior of strongly invertible knots? And of course, we could spend many slides going through results available in the literature on this, uh, but that's a key question for the application. And if you have a knotted or a linked substrate, can you characterize the dense surgery? So now, I didn't tell you. So here, if this substrate is the on, is the on knot, it lifts up to S3. If this substrate is a four plat or a two bridge knot, it lifts up to a lens space. So here you would have a lens space obtained by dense surgery on the exterior of the knot K0. So if the substrate is also a two bridge knot that is not trivial, then you would be dealing with characterizing dense surgery as taking one lens space to another. And that's, that's a key question right there. So if we go back to our pathway. In the pathway, we had steps, and the last three steps of the pathway for the six-crossing link went from trefoil to half link to unknot to unlink. Well, in our paper, we just pinpoint to results in low-dimensional topology that allow us to say the tangles are rational for these three cases, or sums of rational. And uh, I will not go through this, but I have included the the proof for this case from on link to on not this is particularly helpful to people in the tutorial because they saw one yesterday this is a very similar one but you you get the flavor so th those are the steps but i i won't go over that okay so once we can prove that the tangles involved are rational or sums of rational tangles, then we use tangle calculus to find the solutions. And tangle calculus in this case finds three solutions that are biologically meaningful. Sometimes you get a list of five, six, ten solutions, and you discard a lot of them because they don't make sense biologically. They have the, the wrong orientation, they, they just don't make sense physically. Now these three make sense. Well, you have three solutions. How do you discriminate? Biologists are adamant that there must be one mechanism, not three or 300, just one. So how do you discriminate between them? And this is something that was really challenging us throughout the years as we worked on, on different systems, because we always found solutions that seem to be interrelated. I mean, they, they are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. And the biologists did experiments in some cases to try to discriminate the sol through the between the solutions. Their experiments would point to one, but only slightly, no definite answers. And um, so one thing that we realized is that maybe this is a really bad side effect of the framing of the tangle that we're taking. Remember, we equip our tangles with a homeomorphism of pairs that imposes a framing, it pins the points on the equator so that you can look at the diagram with the points on the equator. Well, what if I didn't do that? What if I just let the tangle be in 3D and I looked at different projections? Well, maybe in one projection I see this, and in another I see that, and in another I see that. And that's exactly the case for these solutions. So just uh, I'll and I'll show you that. So these are just uh, references for you to see what the results are that we use for each one of these steps. We find three mechanisms for each one of the steps and they are consistent. Here you have the trefoil, the two sides that come together, recombination happens. And here they come together, but there's a little flip right there. And here there's another flip at the bottom very much related, and you can imagine how this could be an, ar an artifact of the projection. 
just a slight rotation, right? Now, next step, three steps, very similar, very, very similar, same flavor. Last step, three solutions, very similar. They all come neatly together. They all come neatly together. You can spend some time looking at each one of the steps and it makes sense. For these enzymes, biochemically, they need to reset before recombining again. That's because of the biochemistry. And that's what the reset step is here. And then they are rotated by, they can be explained by rotation in three dimensions, by rig rigid motion. And that's what this figure shows you. Start with starting with a six crossing torus link, two sides in parallel alignment, one crossing there, we rotate, that crossing disappeared, see? Now the two sides are in anti-parallel alignment. Now, rigid rotation in space. I'm not uh, perturbing the chain at all. Another crossing will appear right there. And two sides in parallel alignment, but now the arrows point from right to left. And now we're going to do reconnection. Right here, reconnection. Plus one corresponding to the first tangle that was a zero tangle with the uh, parallel sides. Infinity, which corresponds to the second solution that came from the zero tangle with anti-parallel sides. And finally, the minus one tangle that corresponded to the third solution found. So this yields the possibility that there's only one explanation to the mechanism, not three. Tangle method found three. Well, this suggests that maybe the three are different views of the same one, and uh, we need to formalize that. Okay, and now later, and, and this is not a preprint anymore, I need to update my slide. By analyzing band surgeries between fiber links, Bach, Ishihara, Rathbun, and Shimokawa provide tools that can be used to characterize a complete unlinking pathway. So the ones I showed you are for the last bit, and that's what we published in our paper. They have tools for the whole pathway, which is really nice. And um, I will uh, leave it there. I wanted to talk about pathways, removing the assumption, but I can talk to you about that if you're interested offline during the coffee break. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So for that framing question, what we're doing, I had a master, two master students doing this, instead of embedding the tangle and pinning the points to the equator, if they're all on the equator, they're coplanar, the four points are coplanar, well, let's deviate as much as we can from coplanarity and put the endpoints as the vertices of a tetrahedron. This was suggested by the Whitsummers. so now instead of having the four coplanar endpoints, we have them as vertices of the tetrahedron, and we study the symmetries of the tetrahedron to see the different um, projections that we could obtain. But this could be extended to having four points taken at random from vertices of an N vertex polyhedron. Questions? Yes? Yeah, so, so in theory, they could be linking again and in a very small proportion, they might, but what's driving this is the physics. So that's probably comp very unfavorable from a physics point of view. And, and the other thing, I mean, since, since you asked, <laughs> we studied other pathways, and let me just show you what the probabilities of unlinking are. So the probability of going down in complexity is very, very large as compared to the probability of going s anywhere else. So mathematically, that seems the most favored way. And if on top of this, you add energies from physics and entropy, and then, but that's something that we haven't done. I mean, we, I always get the physicists in the audience asking me, what about the energy? And uh, we, we need to do that. But that would be the answer, the short answer to your question. Other questions? Okay, thank you.